Jean Dorothy Seberg was born in 1938 in Marshalltown, Iowa. Her parents were Ed and Dorothy Seberg. Her mom was a stay-at-home wife, stay-at-home mom, and her dad was a pharmacist who ran and owned um, his local pharmacy. Jean had two brothers and one older sister. Um, as a kid, she got really good grades. Um, when she was 14 years old, she joined the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, when she did this, her father was a little bit concerned. Um, he was worried that people would think that she's a communist, which I don't really quite understand, but I guess that was just kind of like the thing of that time. He was just worried about what people would think, and Jean did not care at all what people would think. He recalls Jean telling him that she literally just did not care what people would say or think. So she always had this, you know, instinct to do good for the less fortunate. Um, she always wanted to help. When they were going to their uncle's house for a vacation, because every summer they would go visit their uncle on his farm and stay for a couple of weeks, they met a man who was homeless on the bus. And although Mary was kind of avoiding him and wanted nothing to do with the situation, Jean actually made it a point to make friends with him and have a conversation with him. By the end of their conversation, Jean actually had given this man all of the money that she had on her, which was a $10 bill that her father had given her for um, vacation fees. And this would just kind of become like the theme of her life. Um, she was just very, very giving. When she graduated from high school, her theater teacher arranged for Jean to have a scholarship at a very prominent theater on the East Coast. One night while they were out seeing a movie at a local movie theater, a preview comes on and the preview is about a contest where this director, Otto Preminger, is looking for an actress to play the role of Joan in his upcoming movie, St. Joan which is about Joan of Arc. And all of Jean's friends at the time told her that she needs to audition for this part, that, they sh that she was gonna get this, like she was made for this, this was just like, she had to do it. Um, and Jean wasn't that confident that she could do something like this, but nonetheless, she did end up auditioning. When she did go to audition, Otto's first question to her was obviously, um, you know, how old are you? She replied that she was 17 years old. Otto instantly said that he didn't believe it and he was said to be in complete like shock and awe of her beauty. Um, he also asked her why she wasn't wearing a cross necklace that day. Um, and she kind of was cheeky about this. She replied that her family was too poor to afford one, although that couldn't be farther from the truth. Their family was very, like, probably middle to high class. I mean, or like higher middle class. Um, her family definitely could afford one. Um, but she was just kind of making a joke, and she actually revealed, after making that joke, that... She just wanted to stand out from all of the other girls and she knew that they would all be wearing a cross. So she made the decision not to wear one. Ultimately, after a couple more auditions and a screen test, um, one of the screen tests actually, before she was even chosen for this part, Otto wanted her to cut her hair into that really short haircut that she's known for the pixie cut he wanted her to cut her hair like on the spot for the screen test she actually was willing she did it and the haircut was it looked gorgeous on her i could not pull off that sort of haircut she pulled it off amazingly now 
When it came time to film this movie, St. Joan, Otto began, Otto began to show his true colors. Um, he was definitely a bit of a narcissist. He had no regard for anyone else on the crew. He would throw insults at Jean um, in order to get a better performance out of her. Uh, at least that was his theory. I don't think that would ever work for me. That would just make me break down and cry. During one scene of this movie, there was a gas leak malfunction and she actually ended up getting burned really badly. Um, it was the scene where she is being burned at the stake and although the flames are meant to be there, um, the flames just got way too close to her and as this was happening, you know, she was afraid that no one around her would realize that she wasn't acting and that she was actually in danger. Um, and this actually traumatized her quite a bit. When the movie came out, um, it received pretty bad reviews. Um, bad reviews as far as the plot went, as far as the acting went. None of it was just, none of it was well received by the critics. Um, nonetheless, Otto had Jean star in his next film, which was called Bonjour Tristesse, or Bonjour Tristesse? I think it's Bonjour Tristesse. Anyway, um, that was the next film that she would star in, directed by Otto, and ultimately she, um, ended up signing a contract with Otto for seven years. Um, rumors began to swirl around Hollywood that they were romantically involved. Um, now, I don't believe that Jean ever had feelings for Otto, but I do believe that Otto was quite taken with Jean, and I do believe that it's very possible that he was in love with her. Um, he would buy her flowers, he would buy her clothes, he paid for her living expenses, and, um... This was all outside of the payments that Jean was given through her contract with him. So I do think that's odd, um, but I do think like that was just kind of his attempt to make her, you know, fall for him or keep her under his control. Either way, um, the rumors were quite present that they were involved and a rumor even began that they were engaged. Um, and at one point, a reporter during an interview with Jean ended up asking her, are you engaged to Otto Preminger? Um, she was horrified and she said, no, of course not, you know, all these things. And that's kind of when she started to back away from Otto. So, so let's go back to Bonjour Tristesse. While she was filming this in Paris, while she was filming for this movie in Paris, she met a man named Francois, um, and ultimately she fell in love with him. He was a lawyer. He claimed to come from a very prominent family, um, a very rich family. Um, I'm not sure if that was true or not. I think he did fabricate a lot of the things that he told other people in order to impress them. Jean was also under the impression that Francois was a count, although later on Francois denied ever telling Jean that he was a count. So that's kind of weird, and that just really paints a picture of kind of a shady character. I think Francois was a pretty shady, shady person. Anyway, after filming was completed for Bonjour, um, Jean moved to New York and she began to take more acting classes in New York. And if I'm not mistaken, she actually took classes from the same acting coach that Marilyn Monroe used, ended up using uh, quite often. And she just kind of enjoyed this little break. Francois ended up following her and moved to New York as well. Um, during this time, Francois was making about half as much money as Jean was making, um, which is not to say that that's like a bad thing. Um, 
but it could be said that he was using her for financial gain, prestige, and, you know, just to be part of that whole glamorous circle, which is really, really ironic considering the fact that he, you know, when he met her friends and when they were in social gatherings, he made it a point to tell everyone that Jean really didn't have to work, um, that that was Jean's choice. And if she wanted, she could decide to stay at home and he would support her. But that doesn't really add up. And he also would make um, a lot of negative comments about Hollywood and how toxic it was, which, you know, although maybe true, it was just very negative given the fact that Jean was a part of that world and that was Jean's career choice at that time. Um, so in September of... 1958 when Jean was just 19 years old um, Francois and Jean got married and this was right around um, the time where those rumors involving Jean and Otto being engaged were at their peak so I do kind of find the timing interesting I do think that this marriage was um, a very convenient way to um, dispel all those rumors. <laughs> dispel, is that a word? I think it is. So in 1960 was when Gene Seberg's most um, iconic role took place. She starred in the film Breathless, which was directed by... I'm going to butcher this name. I'm going to butcher it. Jean-Luc Goddard, I believe. Jean-Luc Goddard. Yeah, it was directed by him, that guy. Um, this was like the, the it movie, which made her like the it girl, you know? Uh, she just kind of became an icon. I believe Evie Sedgwick was heavily inspired by her. Um, the whole factory girl image was really inspired by Jean Seberg. In my opinion, I, th I think that's, that's what I think anyway. Um, but yeah, this, this definitely put her on the map in terms of not only acting, but just being kind of like an I iconic movie star. Um, the movie for its time was really different. It was really raw. It was, you know, it was an indie film, but it, it was unlike anything else that was going on at that time. So that was just really cool. Shortly after that film came out, Jean and Francois split up. And I believe this is around the same time where she met Romain Gary, who was a French diplomat. He was an established author, writer. Um, he was married at this time, although he was going through a separation and ultimately filing for divorce. Um, they fell in love. So in 1962, they legally married, and this was after she had already given birth to their son, um, Diego Gary. But she kept this under wraps. Her pregnancy, the birth was all a secret. It remained a secret for years, um, not only to protect Romaine, but also to protect Jean's image. Um, during those times, it just, you know, that's just, I guess, what you did. It was like, I don't know. Think Kylie Jenner times like 20 in terms of like secrecy. And around this time, Jean was on a flight from San Francisco to Los Angeles, and she met a man by the name of Hakeem Jamal, who was married to a woman that was actually a cousin of Malcolm X. Hakeem Jamal um, definitely became... I don't want to say a huge influence in Jean's life, but I think that's really what he was. He answered a lot of the questions that Jean had about the discrimination against black people, civil rights. Um, she was very curious and wanted to know how she could help, and Hakeem was very eager to give her all of these answers and um, tell her just how she could help, which was mostly um, financially. She ended up donating a lot of money to the Black Panther Party, as well as 
um, a Montessori school for underprivileged black children in Compton. Um, she was just, um, she was definitely an ally of the Black Panther Party. And at first, she really wasn't afraid to admit something like that. She didn't realize the consequences of openly being a part of something like that. At one point, um, Hakeem came to Jean saying that either there were, you know, shots fired at his home or um, something along those lines. And Jean, without even hesitating, um, relocated Hakeem and his family, which consisted of his wife and children, to um, one of the homes that she owned in Coldwater Canyon, I believe. Yes. Whatever Hakeem asked her for, she was there to comply. If he mentioned that, you know, the children needed a school bus, she would buy a school bus. Like, things like that. Um, she was very giving, like I mentioned several times. It really frustrated Romaine because he was 20-some years older. He had, you know, already had all these experiences and thought that he could really help Jean and guide her and help her make all of these decisions. But Jean really just didn't want to listen to it. She definitely wanted to do her own thing. And although Romaine saw that her, or at least in his opinion, thought that her attempts to help, help everyone and change the world or like make a difference. Although he thought that those attempts were futile, Jean strongly disagreed and went forth anyway, which unfortunately, sadly, got her in a lot of trouble, which we'll talk about pretty soon here. So we're in the late 1960s now. Um, Jean is filming the movie Paint Your Wagon, which she co-starred in with Clint Eastwood. The two had an affair, although they were both married. Um, this was not out of character for Clint Eastwood, unfortunately. He was known to have sex with and have affairs with multiple women in the industry. Um, Jean, unfortunately, was not privy to this information. She didn't realize that he was a player. Um, <laughs> and she fell for him. She fell for him hard. She even ended up telling Romaine about him and she was prepared to leave him for Clint. Um, but Clint was not going to leave his wife for Jean. So during this time, you know, she became really depressed and allegedly began to drink a lot. Allegedly, Romaine showed up to the set one day and challenged Clint Eastwood to a duel. I don't know if this is true or not, but I definitely read this in multiple different sources. Um, the duel never happened. Uh, a confrontation definitely took place. I don't know about a duel, though. I don't Romaine was definitely not going to let Jean go without a fight. I mean, he was in love with her. When, let's go back a little bit. When Jean Seberg met Hakeem Jamal, Jean immediately was on the FBI's, was on the FBI's radar. She was put on a list. It was an actual list um, that the FBI had. Now, the FBI around this time created um, a, a program, or I guess you could call it a group. It was a program um, called Cointel Pro. J. Edgar Hoover was the basically like the director of the FBI at this time. He was a racist. He was known to be a racist. Um, and he really focused on a lot of civil rights and black activists. Now let's go back to Jean's life. Jean at this time, this was early 1970s. Jean was filming um, a movie called Macho Callahan. Was filming a movie called Macho Callahan in Mexico. She had an affair with a man by the name of Carlos Navarra. Now, this is important and it becomes even more important later in her life. But we'll 
we'll get on to that in a bit. Like I said, she was on their radar and she became a main focus along with a few other celebrities like Jane Fonda. Her phones were tapped in all of her houses. Um, she um, always felt like she was being followed, which she was. Um, her house was broken into. Her cats were poisoned. She grew to be paranoid and neurotic. Rightly so, though. I mean, she was being followed and she was being basically harassed at this point. Now, very sadly enough, this is exactly what happened to Martin Luther King Jr., but times 50. They would send his wife audio recordings of him with other women insinuating that he was cheating. Um, he, they would send him things called suicide packets, which were documents intended to humiliate and shame him and blackmail him. Um, ultimately, they won in the case uh, with Martin Luther King Jr. because he was shot, and I, there's no doubt in my mind that this was behind it. Records show that J. Edgar Hoover kept illegal files on thousands of private citizens, never charged with a crime. Richard Nixon was informed of all of this. He knew of all of this. He approved of all of this, which makes it even more sick. Now, a memo in 1970 shows that Hoover allowed agents to plant false information about Jean Seberg into the press claiming that she was pregnant um, as a result of an affair with a member of the Black Panther Party. Now, this was false. She actually became pregnant either due, either from the affair with Carlos Navarra or by her husband, Romaine Gary. It doesn't really matter either way because the father of her child was not. This rumor was planted and it was ultimately published in Newsweek. Jean was not only upset that her pregnancy was out in the public, she was worried about what her family was going to think. I mean, just sad, man. Okay. On August 23rd, 1970, Jean prematurely gave birth to her daughter, Nina Hart Gary, um, and three days later, the child died. Now, what you won't find on the internet is that while um, she was pregnant, um, she was rushed to the hospital either for an accidental overdose on sleeping pills or an intentional overdose. But that is just, that is allegedly, that's not a fact, that is allegedly. When the child died, she demanded that at the wake, the shot the baby be placed in a glass coffin so everyone could see the color of her skin she basically wanted to put an end to the rumors and you know kind of make a point by saying like hey you were wrong and by the way my child is dead so great job guys um you know and romaine really believed that this miscarriage or it's not a miscarriage, but this uh, this was a result of um, the harassment of the FBI and the um, false rumor that was published in Newsweek. It could be a number of things. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because she lost her daughter and Romaine and Jean were out to sue Newsweek. She yeah. intended to sue Newsweek. Now, unfortunately, that that case would be so huge and they it, it would be taking on, it would be like David and Goliath, you know? Mm. Jean's lawyer advised her that it would take millions of dollars and years and years and years to, to win a case like this or, you know, whatever. So um, they settled for Newsweek publishing um, a correction to the false rumor that they had previously published, along with um, an apology, um, as well as like, I think 20 grand, like a sum of like 20 grand. So it's definitely not what she was expecting. She was expecting quite a large sum, but she at least felt vindicated by the apology and by them acknowledging that the rumor was false and that they had been mistaken. I'm going to wrap up 
part one here and I will leave you hanging for a little bit. Um, hopefully it'll just be a few days in between this video and part two. That way you won't be waiting for too long. I apologize if um, it's been a little rough. I am rusty. It's been months and months and months since I have filmed and I'm really hoping to get back into the swing of it. Anyway, make sure you're subscribed and keep your eyes out for part two, which is gonna come out soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.